Um, Deputy PM, I might kick this off myself because I was really interested to hear you say at the beginning and then again to reiterate it at the uh, at, at the beginning and then to reiterate it at the end that um, you felt a sense of moral obligation to hang on to the portfolio so that you could continue to work to improve the fortunes for those who work in agriculture in this country. So in terms of what you're going to do at the Cabinet table, how much more influence will that bring to bear? What difference will that actually make for agriculture on the national agenda? Uh, well, Lee, uh, just so it's your, it's your nation, um, once you're in the role of uh, Deputy Prime Minister, you're also on the Expenditure Review Committee, which is uh, crucial for the approval of all, of all um, budgetary items. Uh, you also National Security Committee. I hope I don't have much to do with agriculture in that, but um, you're there nonetheless. It's just a reason you're now your ranking in Cabinet goes to number two. Uh, therefore, there's greater weight and um, impetus behind uh, your deliberations. Quite obviously, in that you remain, I was in the leadership group and I remain in the leadership group. Uh, and. To be quite frank, your working relationship with the Prime Minister gives you the capacity to, in a collegiate way, to land on issues without uh, going through the, the combinations and permutations of uh, political gymnastics that you have to do when you first arrive in politics as a backbencher or uh, a backbencher in opposition, uh, where you're trying your very best to influence people at the centre of the circle. Um, as I said, uh, there's not much point in going out and doing a doorstop now to try and bring the show down because I'd be bringing it down on my own head. Um, we are now at the centre of the circle. Thank you. Now we have a question up on my right. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. I'm really, really encouraged and impressed by your um, focus on farming families. And I come from a farming family area in Western Victoria and I'm a PhD student with Monash University. Diane Lewis is my name. My question is about this um, conflict between financialisation of farming families and investments, as you say, of farms, I mean, and trying to keep farming families on the farm. How do we balance that pressure of bringing money into the farming regions and also ensuring that farming families do actually stay on the farm? That's my question. Well, thanks, thanks Diane. And I, I think that that question is not only a question about the economics, Diane, but also about the whole philosophy, and I suppose in a way, Diane, it's one of the things that drove me into politics. Uh, as recently as yesterday, I was saying to colleagues, the whole point of why uh, I, I do this job is the view that uh, in Australia, we will remain a nation where a person can start at the bottom, uh, start with nothing, and, and make their way through the economic stratification and social stratification to get to the top, uh, to be master of their own ship and master of their own ship by their own endeavours. Now, some people may do that by luck, by you know, a, a, the grace of God and have the intelligence and wander off to university and therefore get themselves a, a, a good position within an organise, organisation and transfer through that social stratification in that form. But the dynamism of this nation, I believe, Diane, is done by the people who uh, start from Baradeen and end up near uh, Rowena and become major grain producers such as the Harris brothers. And, uh, and that, that is the dynamism that attracts me. When I was at St George, it was those farming families that came out and took the risk, coming out from the Lockyer Valley, deciding that they were going to be horticultural producers in Western Queensland. That's the dynamism I look for. So what the question you asked, Diane, is what are the policy structure that puts that in place? Well, I suppose one of the first things, Diane, is, is making sure that, uh, and I'll give you two examples. I actually mentioned them in the speech over a whole range. Having Mick Keogh as the ACCC Commissioner uh, concentrating just on rural issues means, Diane, that when you're a small producer and, you're, then, and you may be being exploited by someone with, the, with the massive market power, that you have your own champion within the ACCC just dealing with rural issues and a staff of 12 to make sure that, that you are not exploited, that if you have the right product uh, and you have the right endeavour, that you remain in the marketplace and you're not pushed out by reason of bullying. You might be pushed out because you've got a poor product, you've got the wrong price, but you can't be pushed out because of bullying. To make sure that we continue to drive within the Competition Consumer Act for, for people to be treated fairly. 
to make sure that when people buy a place, and this is why we doubled our farm management bonds from 400,000 to 800,000, because I know as an accountant, Diane, that one of the things that knocks people out is excessive debt. You can do, it doesn't matter how good a farmer you are, if your debt is too high and you can't meet your payments, a can horn is going to come for you. <laughs> so, so, um, but uh, it is, but it's, it's really important. It's really important that uh, we give them all the reason in the world to get their equity up. And that's why I thought, well, how do we come up with a policy that encourages them to get equity? I thought, well, how about we make that $800,000 farm management deposit, which we, we have now got within the, the house, um, be able to be offset against their loan. So basically they're getting a tax deduction on paying off their place. That, that's never happened before. That's new. And that's the sort of ingenuity that's within this government. Um, we are all the time looking at, with this, uh, even right now, trying to expand the water infrastructure. We know as we expand the water infrastructure, there's more opportunities for more farmers to come into that space. Uh, everything we do is trying to create centres of excellence so that we have regional centres where people have a clear line of sight from, from high school to university to research and development. These are the things. And what I'll do, Diana, is always make sure that uh, every day I'll ask myself, if I was starting from nowhere, and to be honest, uh, in my life, uh, I, uh, I got back onto, onto a place uh, without ever having any support from any family. Um, and I want to make sure that that is also what happens to other people as well. Now, in the interests of timing, one last question to the gentleman in the centre, please. Thank you, Deputy Prime Minister. Um, yeah, my answer to my question could have been even in your um, presentation, and it's with regards to the foreign investment, and I guess the answer could lie in all that locked up capital that is sitting in our super funds. I just, the question really sits with why, with regards to the foreign investment, isn't there a greater distinction made between nation-building foreign investment and nation-owning foreign investment. Um, it seems to me that foreign investment in irrigation and facilities and farmlands is already fully developed, it is, is nation-ownership foreign investment, and it doesn't really build the nation. It just seems to be the foreign investment is put into that one basket. Why isn't there a greater distinction between the two types? That's a good question, mate. Just grab your name. Oh, sorry, Andrew Buffler from Lockhart. Andrew, uh, this is an issue that has expressed, uh, it's not that you hold that view, Andrew, lots of people hold that view and we express it. What's the, the difference between foreign ownership and foreign investment? If you're taking an asset from a lower value asset to a higher value asset and, and making sure that uh, the economics is a benefit to all those in the district and everybody gets ahead, then it's an easier case to argue than if it's just a transfer of ownership from one person to another. Um, I hope you've seen, Andrew, that probably, uh, and I have, I have collect collected a lot of ridicule for, at times, uh, my more open questioning of every possible transaction. I, I did believe in the past it was just that anything goes. If you ever questioned anything, apparently you were a pariah, a xenophobe, you're parochial. And this is rubbish. Uh, we, we have every right as a nation to question uh, who is investing in our nation and the purposes for which it's, it, it happens. And I think that it, it is not a case that because you question one, you've therefore qu questioned the whole everything. I think we've seen a clear example of that in the last week, or the last couple of weeks. Um, Van Diemen's Land Corporation has never been owned by uh, anybody who called Australia, was a citizen of this nation. It's always been foreign owned. And there was an immense push to try and, you know, Create a, create a sentiment to, to block that. But the farmers in the area wanted that transaction to go through. Uh, the price that was offered was better than any other, other bid. And so it seemed like a, a, it seemed on the benefit, on the balance of things, a logical thing to do. But the first iteration of the Kidman bid was blocked. Um, and I don't find that it should never, that should never be remarkable. Our nation remains the most liberal nation on earth for people to invest in. You can't buy land in China. You can't, and then people say, well, that's because it's a communist country. Well, you can't buy land in Japan. You can't, but there are many states in the United States you can't buy land. In England, local government organisations, you have to go through an immense sort of bureaucratic process there. Um, front, there's a whole range. This nation remains by far and away the most liberal nation in how you can invest in our land. But that does not mean that our people, the people of this country, don't have the right to question it. And we will. Um, and uh, I want to make sure that uh, as we go forward in the future, and we, right now, I think it's by the end of March, 
Andrew, we should have all, everybody should have submitted to the Australian Taxation Office, um, if they're a foreign owner, who owns what, so we can get a proper, um, a proper expression of who owns what in this nation, because we didn't have it. That was one of the things that we fought for, with, we fought for and got. Uh, we've changed the Foreign Investment Review Board guidelines from 252 million down to 15 before we have to go to the, F the Foreign Investment Review Board. At the time, people said, oh, this will be the end of foreign investment. There'll never be any more. Well, it's actually gone up. The applications have gone up. Um, our counterparts on the other side, the Labor Party, thought they had a political point to score against us. And they said, well, we'll expand it from, we'll take it from your 15 up to a billion, a billion dollars, a thousand million before they have to go to the Foreign Investment Review Board. They then obviously went out on the road and talked to a few people, and uh, that was not the view that they got. They came back and said, actually, we'll go from a billion down to 50 million, which I thought was a remarkable turnaround. Um, we must take the Australian people with us on this journey. If we lose the Australian people, we lose the argument. And so we have to prove to them that foreign investment is in their better interests over the longer term, and that's by showing our capacity to say the word yes, and where appropriate, say the word no.